ideologies. Ideologies can be classified based on the left-right continuum. For example, ideologies of the left tend to undermine the status quo, while ideologies of the right tend to defend the status quo. And in some instances, ideologies of the right even want to go back to the status quo as it existed some time ago. Ideologies of the left emphasize logic as the pathway to knowledge, while ideologies of the right emphasize passion or gut feeling. In other words, this is all about how truth is known. Ideologies of the left tend to arrive at truth through deductive methods, while uh, ideologies of the right tend to rely on instinct, passion, gut feeling. Ideologies of the left preach equality. They prescribe as much equality as possible. So by the time you get to the extreme left, to Marxism and anarchism, you have pretty much equality of results in a society, not just equal opportunity. Whereas ideologies of the right tend to prescribe inequality, treat equals equally and unequals unequally, as the philosopher Plato would say. So when you get to the extreme right, like fascism, you have extreme inequality, whereby the leader has pretty much all the power. Uh, captains of industry have a lot of power, and ordinary people have virtually no power. Ideologies exist because they provide comprehensive answers to political questions, and they arise at the end of the 18th, early 19th century, just at the time when mass politics begins in the Western world, in the United States, and also in Great Britain and France. And as masses begin to get involved in politics, uh, you need to have answers. What is the best way to run politics? And um, religion no longer provides sufficient answers because uh, it loses its hold over the minds of the people, uh, particularly in, in France, where the French Revolution at the very end of the 18th century was very anti-clerical, very much anti-priesthood, anti-the Catholic Church. Um, so if religion is no longer sufficient to provide political answers, uh, and also because religion has been traditionally associated with uh, regimes that were not democratic, and religion uh, was used to justify various non-democratic re regimes like aristocracies, monarchies, uh, therefore, a religion is not fully suitable for uh, the modern world of providing comprehensive political answers. Philosophy, for its part, tends to be highfalutin and too complicated for mass consumption. So ideology is something that is suitable for mass consumption because it's understandable enough and it provides answers that are comprehensive enough for, for the masses. So what kind of answers? Or rather, what kind of questions uh, do ideologies try to answer? Questions like who we are as human beings, where are we going, what's our future as a species, as a society? Uh, what society is a just society, right? What kind of society is just and what kind of society is not just? What is the best form of government? Um, how should we organize the economy? Uh, and uh, what should we do, if anything, to bring about change? So ideologies, they motivate people to political action and make, make it easy for people to think about politics. And at the same time, they serve as a template for political leaders to lead the masses. So it's like a, a series of road signs, right? Ideological precepts are like series of road signs that tell both the masses and the leaders where to go politically. Now, if you look at ideologies of the left, uh, anarchism, communism, socialism would be on the left. And we'll start with anarchism because it's an ideology which I dare say is easy to understand. Uh, anarchism does not have a single founder, but the closest you can get to a single founder would be William Godwin, who was uh, in the late 18th, early 19th century English philosopher and he is considered uh, the first uh, proponent of modern anarchism. So anarchism is all about having no government, right? So A means no, 
monarchy government. Anarchism is the ideology that rejects all government. Uh, but by rejecting all government, it also reduces it also rejects things that oppress the individual but are not necessarily uh, national or state or regional government per se. What do I mean? Anarchism wants total freedom for the individual, but it has to be freedom from more than just the government. It also has to be freedom from all the institutions that the government typically supports and fosters because those institutions oppress the individual. So anarchists say, get rid of the government and people will organize themselves voluntarily and spontaneously to solve their problems. But you also have to get rid of private property because private property oppresses the individual. If I own half of the country where you cannot trespass and you own a t-shirt and the government protects our respective properties, it protects extreme inequality and potential oppression and exploitation of the rich person uh, of the poor person rather by the rich person so you have to get rid of private property and of course for anarchists private property is the result of government it is government that creates laws that govern property and if it had not been for government there would have been no private property as we understand it in modern societies so you have to get rid of private property because it's it's exploitive it's oppressive you, you also should get rid of public education because public education is not real education, rather it's indoctrination and they try to brainwash you to be a quote-unquote a good citizen and to perpetuate values and beliefs that are conducive to oppression. Uh, so get rid of public education. People should organize spontaneously and study whatever it is that they want and not what the government tells them to. And also you have to get rid of the family, including uh, you know, nuclear family, because in the family, uh, the father has all the power and the, the wife and the kids do not. So family is oppressive and it perpetuates because it models on a small scale the oppressive hierarchical governmental structure. So anarchists would rather have children raised, commun be raised communally so that there would be no uh, familial uh, opportunities for oppression. So this is kind of extreme view and of course there have been anarchists throughout the 19th century in Russia like uh, Mikhail Bakunin and Prince Kropotkin. Anarchism has appealed to a lot of people on the Iberian Peninsula and in Italy. Italian anarchists were most likely behind the first bombing of Wall Street in 1920. So anarchism has a distinguished and long history in uh, Europe to a lesser extent in the United States. I should also point out that Leon Scholgesch, an anarchist, uh, shot and mortally wounded President William McKinley in 1901. And uh, in more recent uh, years, I would say that the Occupy Wall Street protests in 2011 had an anarchist inspiration because they were protests against banks and, and I would dare say more generically against private property uh, because the banks were seen as exploitive. They quote-unquote trapped people uh, in bad mortgages and mortgages they, they could not possibly pay. And then the government stepped in and bailed out the banks and people were left uh, uh, holding the bag. People uh, lost their mortgages, their houses, uh, and uh, they were evicted. Uh, but the banks were a okay, uh, so that's the uh, kind of uh, philosophy of anarchism. Gives you some flavor of what this uh, ideology is all about. Communism is associated with uh, the name of Karl Marx, who used kind of a medieval dualism, which came down from him from Georg Hegel, who was another German philosopher and preceded Marx. Uh, and what I mean by dualism is this uh, clear differentiation between good and evil and uh, these two clear opposites are struggling against one another. So Marx took this idea of good versus evil uh, in uh, locked in a perennial struggle against one another and he materialized them. That is to say he said uh, all history is a history of struggle. But it's not a struggle of ideas or ideals uh, or spirits. 
it rather it is a struggle of social classes and classes are defined by uh, their relationship to um, to property right to the, and more specifically to the means of production so in every stage of history there's a class that owns nothing except its labor and then there's a class that owns either that labor or uh, the means of production to which labor needs to have access in order to work. So, for example, Marx says at first there were slaves and there were slave owners in the ancient world. You find slavery pretty much everywhere, and uh, slaves own nothing, uh, not even their labor, and so they're being exploited by slave owners. And there's a class struggle because of exploitation. Class struggle is inevitable. And so some Lex Spartacus rebellion in the ancient Rome would be given by Marxists as an example of class struggle between slaves and slave owners. Then you have feudalism, and uh, the serfs uh, are tied to the land, and they own obligation to their feudal uh, landlords uh, to produce for them. And most of the most of what they produce, most of the crops they 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 produce is for the for for their uh, landlords, so there's an obligation, uh, feudal obligations, uh, and that's an exploitation, right, by the feudal landlords over the uh, serfs. And then there is uh, capitalism, in which labor is much freer than it ever has been, because labor fully owns itself, but it is forced to sell, sell itself. The workers or the proletariat uh, is forced to sell its labor to capitalists because capitalists own factories and they own offices and if you want to work you have to sell your labor and it's exploitation because uh, you do not get paid uh, what you actually earn because a portion of what you earn is being kept by the capitalist as surplus value that's the profit and so instead of you getting the full amount that you work for the capitalist takes that and reinvests it into more production so as to open another factory or another office and so keep it going to, to continue to make profit so that profits could be reinvested into production or uh, spent by capitalists in acts of conspicuous consumption like buying uh, another mansion or buying a yacht. So eventually labor becomes so poor that it rises up spontaneously, according to Marx, overturns uh, capitalism, establishes brief dictatorship of labor, dictatorship of the proletariat, and soon thereafter, all private property is abolished, uh, the dictatorship of the proletariat itself disappears, it withers away, and you have communism. You have a society based on the principle from each according to his labor to each according to his need so all your needs uh, would be satisfied under communism and people would work why would they work what incentive would they have to work uh, because it's a human need according to marx to work uh, but to work in a meaningful way where you can express yourself creatively and spontaneously and so according to him uh, during uh, communism there would be no more exploitation and there would be no more uh, social classes and marx the Marx expected that there would be a proletarian revolution during his lifetime. He didn't specify a, a date on which that event was supposed to take place, but it is clear from his writings that he was not thinking in terms of centuries. He was thinking, you know, uh, maybe years, uh, may, maybe decades. It was, it was imminent, really. It was about to happen. And, of course, when he did not see it happen, he, he felt... Uh, sort of disillusioned and now we know that uh, when communism does come to power on its own and not as a result of conquest but when it comes to power on its own uh, it comes to power not in the most economically developed industrial countries but in rural in agrarian countries like Russia like China uh, like Cuba so uh, Marx was uh, incorrect about uh, the, the chain of historical events and in terms of the uh, most industrialized, most economically developed countries becoming communist. Uh, but you can certainly uh, understand the appeal of uh, this ideology because it promises a lot. I mean, it promises paradise. 
It is related uh, to anarchism in that the final destination of communism is pretty much the same as the final destination of anarchism. Total freedom, spontaneity, no uh, obligation to work, and the world of plenty, the world of security and of, of abundance. So uh, in terms of uh, the end result, uh, Marxism is not really is not different from anarchism. It's just different in terms of analysis of how you get there because Marxism is this backward-looking ideology that tries to explain all of history in terms of class struggle. Now, socialism is related to communism, and in fact, Karl Marx called his system scientific socialism. But socialism, in reality, is uh, more flexible and has a greater range greater variation than Marxism. Uh, so socialism is all about society. Henri de Saint-Simon, who is pictured there on the sl slide you're looking at. Uh, so he was one of the founders of socialism. And socialism believes that society has to come first. And uh, the reason why is because all of our accomplishments and all of what we are really is inextricably connected to society. It really comes down to us from society. For example, let's say you're a very successful businessman. I don't know, maybe a Donald Trump. And um, how did you become successful? Is your success entirely attributable to your uh, hard work and personality? Uh, probably not, because you had workers working for you, right? And how did they, how did your accountants, your lawyers, uh, and in fact, your, your, your maids, whoever it is that you need to run your businesses, how did they get the skills to work for you? Did you personally educate and train them? Probably not. Probably they got their education starting in public schools, kindergartens, public schools, and then colleges and universities. Perhaps they also went to public colleges and universities, the overwhelming majority of uh, people uh, who graduate college in this country actually attend some kind of state uh, institution. So uh, socialists also would point out, well, how do people get to your place of business? If you own Trump Tower, uh, do you also own the roads that lead to it, that allow customers to reach your hotel? Well, obviously you do not. Obviously the roads, you did not build the roads. The roads were built by uh, city or state and uh, they were built at the public expense. So all that we have financially is connected, is deeply connected to social accomplishments. So we, we must recognize that. And for this reason, socialists preach a significant degree of equality. Now, in, in actuality, particularly since the 20th century, socialists do not preach perfect equality, uh, but uh, they want to have at least a minimal, high, uh, minimal welfare floor for all. So they, they would provide uh, health care, they would provide education for free, and education would not be just you know, uh, school K through 12, as, as we understand it in the United States, but uh, it, it would also be college and university uh, would be free to all citizens. Uh, extensive network of social programs, very generous pensions guaranteed by the government, and uh, long vacations. So socialists, in order to achieve that very high floor of social welfare for all, uh, practice and preach redistribution. So uh, taxes would be very progressive. It would be very high on people who are well off, and they would be very low on people who are not well off. Uh, in the 20th and 21st centuries, such socialism that does exist and that shows that at least some uh, elements of success would be, uh, you know, democratic uh, socialism uh, of countries like uh, Sweden, for example, and, and even France. These countries politically do not want anything to do with the kind of communism that existed uh, behind the Iron Curtain in the Soviet Union or in China or in Vietnam. No, they want and they practice democratic politics, but there's a significant governmental involvement in the economy and society to redistribute wealth and provide high 
welfare floor for all. Now, in the middle of ideologies, we find liberalism. And liberalism is so important because it's the central ideology in the United States and North America, in, in more generally, because Canada, much of the supplies to Canada too. Uh, so classical liberalism begins with uh, John Locke, 17th century uh, English philosopher. And uh, Locke was very much admired by the founding generation uh, in American colonies and early United States. Uh, for example, Thomas Jefferson patterned his Declaration of Independence on Locke's uh, book, uh, The Second Treatise of Government. So uh, classical liberalism is all about putting the individual at the center. Individualism comes first. Society exists to help individuals, to support individualism, not the other way around. Individualism does not serve society. It's the society that serves individualism. The second principle is fairness. Americans are very fond of saying, this is fair, that's not fair. So fairness is uh, opposite of arbitrariness. Liberalism rejects the whim, the whimsy, uh, the mood of arbitrary power. Rather, it wants to base decisions on neutral procedures, predetermined neutral procedures. For example, if you're taking a college course and you expect to get a particular grade, you know why you expect to get a particular grade. For example, because your scores correspond to this grade. You have taken every test that is uh, outlined in the syllabus and you have earned a specific number of points and based on those points, you expect to get a particular course grade. That's fairness because that's following predetermined specific procedures. The arbitrariness would be for a professor to say, you know, I'm going to give grades based on a coin toss or based on the mood I'm in uh, during the day I'm assigning grades. That would be arbitrary and we would say that's unfair. Uh, so that's, that's the notion of fairness. Finally, there's limited government. So because uh, society is here to serve the individual, the government has to be limited. It should not oppress the individual too much. Rather, when it does limit individual freedom, it has to limit it in such a way as to, at the same time, to also protect it. Let, let me give you an example. For example, the, uh, drive on the right side of the road. Why can't you drive, if you're in the United States, on the, right, on the left side of the road? Because uh, we'd have chaos, we'd have accidents, property damage, injuries, and even death. So you have to have some kind of ground rules that everyone is required to follow. Because if people uh, can choose not to follow them, we would have all these adverse consequences. Uh, then some individuals would be taking the right of property and life away from others. So you, you can have it. Uh, we have laws against theft, for example. Why doesn't an individual A have the freedom to burglarize individual B's house and steal his stuff? Well, because obviously that would violate individual B's freedom to enjoy the property and the security that are rightfully his. So, yes, there are limitations in a liberal society on what individuals can do, but these limitations are neither arbitrary nor extensive. Rather, they exist to protect individuals. Okay. Now, uh, classical liberalism experienced a crisis uh, during the Great Depression because individual responsibility seemed insufficient to explain a very high rate of unemployment of about 25% in 1933 and the inability of people to pull themselves by their bootstraps, something seemed to have gone awry. And what, what has changed between the age of John Locke and the early America uh, and the age of uh, the Great Depression was, was bigness. Big institutions, big corporations. And when big corporations and big banks would go bust, many people, millions of people would lose their jobs and you would have uh, social tension. You would have economic and social crisis. And uh, one answer to, to the tension and the crisis 
it was a liberal, liberal answer. So liberal liberals, whom we today simply call liberals for short, uh, begin to say, let the government, particularly the national government, take care of those problems that seem to overwhelm the individual. The individual is just lost, is just overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of economic and social problems. And especially because the extended family is no longer there to help him out. The extended family bonds have worn thin. Uh, people uh, still have their nuclear families, but there is not much of an extended family to help them out. Also, their neighbors are not particularly willing to help them out, either because neighbors themselves are suffering economically, or because neighbors no longer know each other. And that's that's true, certainly, if you live in a big city, uh, particularly if you are in a, in a transient city, uh, but in any big city. Neighbors generally do not know each other, and certainly would not just start giving or even lending uh, each other money uh, randomly just to help out their neighbor when their neighbor is in trouble. No, if you need money, you go uh, to a bank, or if you need money, you go uh, for and get a job. But if you can get neither the loan from a bank nor a job from a corporation for which you used to work and which laid you off because it's no longer profitable for them to keep you employed, then you're in trouble. There's no one to help you. And you may still turn to charity or church, but if there are millions of people who are in dire straits economically, then even charities and churches are being overwhelmed. And so liberals begin to say the only way to properly address this is to have the government, particularly the national government with its massive resources, try to help individuals who cannot help themselves. And this is the essence of liberalism. You use social programs in order to help individuals who cannot help themselves. And that really comes out of the 1930s. And you have a lot of social programs, the most enduring and significant of which was uh, social security. Uh, but in the 1960s, this idea was extended because the argument went like this. There are many different types of individuals who simply cannot fully compete who simply do not start out on a level playing field with other individuals, maybe because of history of prior discrimination, maybe because they are physically or mentally handicapped, maybe because they have experienced some real significant tragedy or illness in their lives that does not allow them to get back on their feet very quickly. So what does this mean? This means that the government has to be used to help those individuals. So you have in the 1960s, particularly during the Johnson administration, extensive uh, governmental involvement, the Great Society programs meant to, in fact, ambitiously end all poverty. Of course, we now know how that turned out. But the idea was uh, logically uh, sense a sensible idea. Uh, let's end all uh, poverty. And, and so uh, if, you have, if you no longer have poor individuals, then uh, individualism can flourish. Because if you're not poor, it's much easier to be an individual. If you're destitute and you're thinking about where your next rent payment is coming from or where your next meal is coming from, it's very difficult to lead a satisfying life and express yourself as an individual. So that's liberal liberalism. And of course, it produced a reaction. And it produced a reaction in, uh, in the following sense. Uh, Poverty was not being reduced. Uh, riots were still taking place, in fact, more than ever. Uh, and uh, you have uh, the breakdown, gradual breakdown in uh, the nuclear family. And the conservatives uh, begin to say, liberalism doesn't work. The cure of liberalism, in fact, is... Uh, worse than the remedy, than the melody that it's, try, it's trying to fix. Uh, and, and remember, the melody of the problem was uh, poverty, uh, it, it was misery, and conservatives say liberalism is wrong. What, what you have to do to fix you know, problems of poverty that plague some individuals is to go back to individual responsibility, emphasize that. Uh, you have to go to back to traditional values particularly to family values and to strong communities. And you have to resist 
economic regulation because economic regulation stifles business initiative. So conservatives want less economic regulation. They want less taxation, but they want more of traditional values and more by way of individual uh, responsibility. So uh, the reaction uh, to conservatism, uh, uh, conservatism was libertarianism. Libertarianism liked the conservative emphasis on economic freedom, but disliked the conservative emphasis on uh, traditional values and the preachy attitude toward individual responsibility, particularly when it was delivered by conservative conservatives in the guise of religiosity and, and uh, r religious dogma. So libertarians say conservatives are basically right on the economy, uh, but libertarians want to go even further. They want to privatize almost everything. Uh, so any, anything that the government controls at any level, from city to the national government, they want to privatize it if at all possible. If it's not possible to privatize, then the government should contract out to private services, have private services, uh, private businesses deliver the services. The government itself has to be very limited, and the national government uh, should be limited to national defense, uh, some courts, uh, there may be some law enforcement, although libertarians do not trust law enforcement because law enforcement is government, you know, they're the cops, man. They want uh, private security services if possible, but they recognize that some government law enforcement may be inevitable. Libertarians reject very passionately the conservative emphasis on uh, traditional values and, and the preachy nature of uh, individual responsibility. Libertarians res uh, respect the individual choice to do whatever the individual wants. And yes, there will be individual responsibility if you fail to act in a civilized way uh, through engaging in, 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 in your individual behavior, but there should be no prior restraints, according to libertarians. So the contrast would be this. If conservatives say, let's not legalize drugs, let's not legalize prostitution, because we should have traditional, strict family values and libertarians would say the opposite. They would say, decriminalize, decriminalize prostitution, decriminalize the use of drugs, uh, because these are victimless crimes. And instead of wasting governmental resources on trying to punish these victimless crimes, you're much better off using these resources somewhere else and allowing individuals to do whatever it is, it is that they want with their bodies. After all, it's individual autonomy. Now, if somebody messes up or, 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 or on this responsibility, if someone, for example, drives under the influence, uh, then of course they can be punished for that. Uh, but, but you shouldn't, for this reason, have this general prohibition on drugs, this war on drugs that conservatives ha have traditionally advocated. So that's libertarianism. Libertarianism in the United States has traditionally uh, been strong in Western states like Colorado, Nevada, Arizona, Wyoming. Uh, uh, th these are tr states with uh, frontier ethos, with traditional emphasis on uh, individual, uh, individual uh, freedom. Now, the last variation of conservatism that I want to cover uh, here is neoconservatism. Neoconservatism was founded by the philosopher Leo Strauss in the 1940s and 50s, working at the University of Chicago. Leo Strauss saw too much individualism as the greatest threat to the American society. In fact, he believed the threat was significant enough to uh, pose existential danger to America, that the United States itself might fall apart if we do not deal with excesses of individualism. So he would say that people just spend too much time uh, in trivial and wasteful activities, too much time watching television, too much time and money going to strip clubs, too much time and money drinking. And he wanted to bring back uh, individuals to a state of greater responsibility. So what did he, how did he plan to accomplish that? 
he wanted the country to have an intellectual vanguard. Vanguard means those who march forward. And this intellectual vanguard would know that its role was to guide the masses, even if it meant lying to the masses. So the vanguard would propagate the myth of the nation and the myth of religion. The myth of the nation meant that the United States had a mission to fight evil around the world. Now, it's called myth of the nation because uh, it's, it's not true, really. It's not true that the United States has this mission to fight evil around the world. But it's important for the masses, for ordinary people, to believe that it is true. And the vanguard would know that it's a myth, but the people would not. The people would actually buy it, hook, line, and sinker. And uh, once they bought it, their minds would be focused on that mission more, and they would be focused less on their individual self-gratification. So they would be presumably less wasteful, uh, less indolent, uh, and more civic-minded because of this, because they would, they would think, how should America fight evil today and not how much more money can I spend at the strip club? Uh, also, the myth of religion. The myth of religion meant that religion, according to Leo Strauss, was not true. None of the religions were. They were all human inventions. They were just cultural products of societies. But it was important for the masses to believe that religion is true. And so the intellectual vanguard that would rule the country would continuously put this notion forward to the masses that they should attend church, they should be religious, because religion uh, puts restrictions on uh, human conduct. Uh, you have to behave in a way that limits your individual freedom, in a way that is moral. So uh, he believed that the religion had a salutary uh, impact that way on, on society. and. Um, during his lifetime, he didn't have all that much impact, and he himself was a bit of a hermit, a bit of a reclusive figure. Uh, he didn't like uh, to be interviewed very much. He didn't want to appear on television. A uh, few pictures of him have been taken, but he did want to have a loyal group of students uh, who would follow, uh, follow through on his ideas, and he got that. Uh, some of his students became important players during the Reagan and the first Bush administration, and then again during the second uh, Bush administration. Uh, I'm talking about George uh, W. Bush between 2001 and 2009. So in the second Bush administration, we saw a mutation or variation of neoconservatism. Remember, original neoconservatives argued that America suffered from too much individualism, but the new neoconservatives in the second Bush administration believed that America was just the best society you can possibly have. In fact, it had the right degree of individualism, and it has achieved the best form of government that a society could have. That is to say, democracy based on individual choice. Why do you go and vote for a particular politician? Because you believe that politician would be conducive to your happiness, to your selfish desires, that in fact we have reached the highest stage of history conceivably possible, the end of history, as Francis Fukuyama put it in his book, The End of History and the Last, uh, and the Last Man. So if by the late 80s, early 90s, they already, neoconservatives already began to mutate into this different variation that Leo Strauss himself never put forward. It was, in fact, uh, the opposite uh, of Leo Strauss in terms of its embrace of individuality and the democracy that flowed from it. And so, uh, uh, in uh, 1997, they formed, uh, these neoconservatives formed the Project for the New American Century, or PNAC, and they said, we can change the world uh, faster than it would, would change on its own. So we already saw that communist regimes in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union collapsed, but they're still, and they're becoming democratic, but there's still parts of the world like the Middle East that are not yet democratic. And uh, what, what we should do is we should spread democracy to the Middle East and simultaneously, by the way, increase the position of the United States in the world. We can enhance it 
And we can tell the American people that, well, the United States has a mission in the world and that that mission is to fight, to fight evil. But this time the evil was defined as terrorism. It was not called communism anymore, but it was called in international terrorism. And we would say, well, the terrorists really hate us for our freedom, which is why they, they are carrying out all these terrorist acts. And Saddam Hussein is at the center of all this. And so the idea was to go to Iraq, overthrow Saddam Hussein, which would produce shock and awe across the region. And, and Iraq would become democratic uh, very quickly, and it would like the United States. And then uh, other neighboring countries would see their populations rise up against their regimes. So Syria would presumably go democratic. Iran would go democratic. And so, according to this logic, uh, the United States would liberate uh, the Middle East from its dictatorship and push it forward, would speed up its development towards the best form of human organization conceivably possible, which is individually based democracy. And so we, we saw how that turned out. Not very well. Uh, but that, that's neoconservatism. Finally, fascism. Uh, it comes from the Italian word fasciare, to fasten or to bind. Benito Mussolini is one of its founders. As a former socialist, Benito Mussolini became disillusioned you know, with the promise of socialism and uh, became a fascist. The symbol of fascism is an axe tied to a bunch of sticks. And this is an ancient uh, Roman Republican symbol that symbolizes unity and uh, the power of authorities to punish. Uh, fascism emphasizes the country as the main focus of analysis. Uh, for fascism, super patriotism is the greatest thing that you can have. According to fascists, nothing exists, much, has, much less has any meaning outside uh, your country. So you, uh, the key, the key for the average person in a fascist society is to be super patriotic. Patriotism is everything to fascists. Um, and uh, fascism is a society that is passionately, vehemently anti-liberal. It revolts against the cult of the individual because it believes that too much individualism is what really destroys the human spirit. We are human beings, and, and to be a human being is very different than to be an individual because human beings have to uh, live with each other meaningfully and not merely compete against each other in an endless rat race toward nothing, uh, toward material wealth, which is meaningless at the end anyway, and is never going to bring satisfaction, nothing to individuals, nor to society as a whole. So uh, for this reason, uh, fascists reject individualism, and they reject democracy, which is after all based on the choice of individuals at any given time, where you hold elections, and based on the mood of individuals, you have votes, and you have a particular people, particular politicians, winning their positions as a result of that. Fascism wants to reject that. Fascism wants to emphasize the general will of the population. And the general will can be represented only by a dictator and not by ephemeral, changeable passions of individuals. So dictatorship is key to, uh, to fascism. Fascism emphasizes social strength and militarism. A healthy society, according to fascists, is going to be militaristic and it's going to want to increase its territory at the expense of weaker countries. So Mussolini wanted to reconstruct the Roman Empire and, you know, hence his conquest uh, of Libya and his, the, his aggression. Um, fascism believes in an organic society and not in a society of isolated individuals. So it's a society where one is for all and all is for one. And to bring this about, uh, uh, fascists would practice corporate state. In a corporate state, there would be a comprehensive economic policy for the whole country, and it would be developed by the government, the national government, in cooperation with uh, leaders of private corporations. And uh, in, in this cooperation, the government would be the senior partner, and it would try to develop uh, in conjunction with corporate leaders, the economic policy that would benefit the country as a whole. So you would not allow, definitely, 
the major corporations to do whatever it is that they want to do on their own because that is contrary to the general social interest. Uh, so uh, these are the elements of, of fascism. When Hitler came to power, uh, he needed um, a, a kind of intellectual foundation for his racialist uh, ideology. And, and so he said, well, what we have here, we are going to call that fascism. So Mussolini was a little bit resentful that Hitler did that, but he couldn't, he couldn't do much about it. Mussolini considered Hitler to be intellectually, intellectually inferior to himself. But uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's interesting that he couldn't do anything about it. And uh, Italy and Germany were defeated uh, in World War II, and so fascism uh, in those countries collapsed. Uh, but in uh, Spain and in Portugal, the two fascist dictatorships that did not enter the Second World War and therefore could continue to keep their fascist regimes well into the 1970s, um, when, when uh, finally they threw, threw out their, their fascist dictatorships, uh, it turned out that fascism uh, did not work well at all uh, economically, even in times of peace. Uh, it turned out their economies were more primitive, they were weaker and poorer than economies of uh, democracies, of economically advanced democracies like Great Britain and the United States. Uh, so this is a general uh, overview of ideologies.